The Werewolf of Paris by Guy Indoor, book review. Uh, so this is an interesting book. I discovered this book because of my interest in the Paris Commune, something I've done several books on now on this channel. Uh, Paris Commune was a revolution in Paris in 1871. Uh, it, it's famously associated with uh, the working class revolutions, uh, socialism or anarchism, communism. Anyways, I've been interested in this for quite some time and I was looking for historical fiction based on the Paris Commune just because I, I've always been a bit of a historical fiction nerd. I mean, I like history, but I also like learning history through a novel. So I was just searching for historical fiction on the Paris Commune, and this popped up. And this is a bit bizarre. It's a werewolf story, and you're like, well, I wasn't expecting to find that, right? Um, but yeah, uh, written in 1933 by an American, Guy Indoor. Uh, and uh, I thought, yeah, I'll go along with this. I, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Did you ever feel like a book was exactly written to your specific interests? I mean, I was, I was really interested in the Paris Commune already. And I love a good horror story. Uh, I've been fascinated by, by gothic horror stories since I was young. And particularly, I always really liked werewolf stories uh, as a kid. And so, it's like this novel was tailor-made for me. Um... Anyways, so the Paris Commune and werewolves seems like a bit of an odd choice, but actually as you read the book, it works. And, and it works on a number of different levels. <clears throat> First of all, the uh, Paris Commune is, in, Commune is in the 1870s, so it's got that 1800s Gothic feel, just like uh, Dracula uh, took place in the 1800s, or I think Frankenstein was written at the beginning of the 1800s. Uh, secondly, the starvation accompanying the Siege of Paris and the massacres following the Civil War give the book an additional macabre tone that adds to the grimness of the story. Also, all the social upheavals and chaos going on during the revolutionary period of the Paris Commune create an explanation as to why the werewolf attacks went largely unnoticed by the public and undetected by the police. They had bigger things to worry about, so the, the werewolf was able to attack people undetected. Uh, and then, when they finally do come face to face uh, with evidence of werewolf attack, uh, they refuse to believe it because the commune was anti-clerical. They, they didn't like the Catholic Church, and so they associated it with uh, the superstitions of the Catholic Church. <clears throat> uh, it's funny how many Western horror stories are based on old church superstitions or kind of mythology. Mythology of the Catholic Church. Actually, maybe that's not that funny, given how influential the church has been on Western history and culture. Uh, of course, that's where it would come from. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lastly, and most importantly, the fall of the Paris Commune becomes very important to the theme of this book. And this is revealed in a very clever little shift at the end. Spoiler alert, I guess. Uh, up until the end of the book, the narrative is so hyper-focused on the werewolf. Uh, you know, other stuff is going on but you're focused in on the werewolf, and it's like, oh, the werewolf killed another prostitute. Oh, isn't this horrible? This is terrible. Uh, and, you know, the main character is trying to track down and stop the werewolf from doing all these killings. And then all of a sudden, in the last chapter, we get to the massacres that happened at the end of the Paris Commune, which is historical. At, at the end of the Paris Commune, there, there was a, a, a number of massacres by the French government. And so all of a sudden, you, the narration pulls back and you're like, you know, all this time, you were concerned about a handful of people that the werewolf killed. 
uh, you're so concerned about the werewolf, you forgot what huge evil humanity is capable of. I mean, so what if the werewolf killed a handful of people? Uh, the Paris government, government massacred thousands of people that same week. Uh, and so that's, that's just a very clever trick uh, to, to play on the reader. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll quote the part of the book where this little trick comes in. This is going to sound a little bit abrupt coming out of context, but hopefully you can get the, the idea. Ammar soon discovered that he was talking nonsense. The commune shot 57 from the prison of La Roquette. Versailles retaliated with 1900. To that comparison, add this one. The whole famous reign of terror in 15 months guillotined 2,596 aristos. <clears throat> the Versailles executed 20,000 commoners before their firing squads in one week. Do these figures represent the comparative efficiency of guillotine and modern rifle? Or the comparative cruelty of upper and lower classes? The werewolf, it now seemed to Ammar, was but a mild case. What was a werewolf who had killed a couple of prostitutes, who had dug up a few corpses, compared with these bands of tigers slashing at each other with daily increasing ferocity. And there'll be worse, he said. And again he had that marvelous rising of the heart. Instead of thousands, future ages will kill millions. It will go on, the figures, the figures will rise, and the process will accelerate. Hurrah for the race of werewolves. End quote. Now that was written in 1933, and in retrospect, that looks very prophetic. I mean, it's sad that that was prophetic, but that was. I mean, he, he's predicting that in future ages they, they'll kill millions, uh, and indeed they did. Um, the World War II the Holocaust, the Vietnam War, uh, Pol Pot, you know, the, the death camps of Stalin and Mao, and, you know, all of that was after 1933. I mean, Stalin was around in 1933, but I, I don't think the death camps, camps were fully underway. All the rest of that was all after 1933. So, yeah, it's... It's sad how accurately he predicted the 20th century. Yeah, but there you go. Now, the author was an American, uh, Guy Indoor. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that name right. Uh, he was an established historical novelist. He'd written a number of historical novels before. Novels about uh, Alexander Dumas, Voltaire, the Marquis de Sade, uh, in addition to being a horror writer. So by the time this book came out, he was well established in both camps. Uh, he was a man of many talents. Uh, and he'd also written a lot about French history. In fact, all those historical novels I just named were also about French history. So he's very comfortable talking about the revolutions of 1848, the Paris Commune in 1871. Uh, his novel is just dotted with dates and references to French history. Uh, and actually, many historical figures appear in this book. Uh, figures from the commune like Raoul Regault, who was the commune's head of police, and Gustave Corbet, who was the commune's head of art. Uh, both of them make appearances in this novel. Also, there was this bizarre historical affair, and, th and this is real history. This has popped up in a few books I've read now on the Paris Commune. So during the Paris Commune, where the revolutionaries were in control, there was this little bizarre incident where they were investigating a Catholic churchyard and they found what appeared to be a secret prison and a secret graveyard with, with these bones there. And to this day, nobody really knows what that was. Uh, the, I think the, the um, 
Catholic Church maintained that it was all innocent and it was just, uh, you know, like a holding pen for mentally ill people who would otherwise have harmed themselves. Uh, the revolutionaries, being anti-Catholic Church, immediately assumed it was some sinister, uh, you know, human trafficking thing and the bones of the victims were buried there. Uh, and to this day, nobody really knows what it is, but you can imagine an odd historical detail like this is going to fit perfectly into this story about werewolves during the Paris Commune. So he, he does integrate this into the novel. Uh, he also integrates another conversation which is historical, and I, again I know this because it's come up in other books I've read on the Paris Commune, non-fictional ones. Uh, Raoul Rigault, uh the head of the commune's police was intensely anti-clerical. He was examining some police at one point, and I'll quote from the novel, but this is a, a real historical exchange. Rigault examined them personally. What is your profession? He asked a Jesuit. Servant of God. God? What is your master's address? He is everywhere. Right, Regalt said to one of his secretaries, so-and-so, styling himself servant of God, citizen God, a vagabond without fixed address. Uh, and again, that's quoting from the, the novel, but that same exchange has come up in real histories I've read. Now, Guy Indor was a leftist. He, he was one of these guys who was blacklisted by Hollywood during the blacklisting period in the 1950s. Uh, and perhaps that's another reason why he chose the Paris Commune as his setting, because, you know, this is a famous piece of leftist history. And yet, he is not overly sympathetic to the Commune leaders. Uh, and if you read the novel, you'll see that he tends to portray them as out-of-control madmen and egomaniacs. And that exchange with Raoul Regalt, one of the Commune leaders I just quoted, uh, gives you an indication. <clears throat> Uh, however, he does go through great efforts to make very clear that the Commune only killed a handful of people and the Versailles French government killed thousands of people. So it, it is clear where his sympathies lie. Fascinating book. Uh, I, I completely recommend it. You, you can track it down on Amazon. Published in 1933, it's a bit, it was a bestseller back in its day. Uh, and uh, I, th I think it's still in print. Uh, New York Times did, a, I think, a review of a reprint of it that came out a few years ago. So I think it's one of these books that's maybe not constantly in print, but gets rediscovered every now and again and put back into print. Uh, last thing I want to mention is um, the, the connection between this book and Hollywood. Uh, so this book came, took, came out in 1933, uh, so during the classic age of the Universal monster movies. Uh, and it's rumored by some people that this book has a connection with the werewolf movies that came out later. So there was Werewolf of London, which came out shortly after this book, uh, and you can see that there's a parallel title there. The Werewolf of Paris, The Werewolf of London. I actually saw The Werewolf of London way back when uh, I was into old movies as, as a teenager and this was on cable. Um, but also the famous Wolfman movies with Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, I've seen people argue on the internet that, well, this book didn't directly inspire the Wolfman movies, this book being a bestseller back in its day kind of put werewolves back in vogue and may have indirectly inspired the Wolfman movies. Um, and you know, like there's no, right, like Dracula comes from the Dracula book, Frankenstein comes from the Frankula, Frankenstein book, uh, but there's no Wolfman book, right? There's no like classic Wolfman book that the, these uh, universal monster movies are based on except maybe this book. Um, other people, though, have said that actually there's no connection at all between this and the Wolfman movies. So, uh, yeah, I guess just whatever. Um, Guy Indoor actually did work for Universal Pictures. He was a, a screenwriter. 
Uh, and somebody left a comment on my review of this movie, which I actually did not independently research myself. So, I don't know, take this with a grain of salt if you wish, or do your own research on this. But I, I thought this was interesting, so I'll read it out. It says, from what I've been able to find, when Universal was looking to expand their horror line, this novel had just come out and become a bestseller. So they hired Indoor as a screenwriter in the hopes he'd sell the rights to them cheap. He wouldn't, they didn't get along, and he was soon writing for other studios. In the same year, Mark of the Vampire was released, an MG MGM film he wrote as a play on the Universal movies, and even starring Bela Lugosi, who had himself recently left the studio. Universal took a few jabs of their own by putting out the similarly titled uh, though largely recycled from their earlier Jekyll and Hyde script, Wolfman of London, as well as The Raven, which suspiciously declined to credit Indoor, despite him having written the original 19-page treatment for it during his time with the studio. So, while the book is not the basis for Wolfman of London, both it and its author were party to its development. Was it Wolfman or London of London or Werewolf of London? Ah, I'm going to have to Google that. I remember Werewolf of London, actually, being the title of the movie. Uh, the person who left the comment said Wolfman of London. Anyways, I'll leave it on that note. Uh, you can do your own research on this, or if, you've, if you know anything, let me know in the comments.